Hi guys and welcome back to this second video in the series on introduction to containerization of software and we are going to be looking at using specifically Docker and then Kubernetes in production in order to see what the kind of benefits are of using containerization and how simple it is really to get this all up and running. Now as I mentioned in the first video Although I'm using Docker and Kubernetes, there are other orchestrators, there are other containerization products available. They all have kind of different pros and cons, but Docker currently, it's both probably the, the best supported, the most well known. And also it's the one that I've used personally, which is why I've chosen to use Docker. But most of the concepts here will exist in all of the other container runtimes. So before you commit to anything in production, do your homework, find out what else is available and why you might or might not choose to use Docker. About me, uh, as I mentioned in the first video, I'm a development manager currently and I've done a lot of work in .NET, C and C++ in the early days and use kind of quite a few cloud platforms, quite a few deployment technologies, but I am new to containers. So I'm kind of learning this as I go along as well, which means that, uh, you know, there might be some mistakes along the way and I might say things that are maybe not quite 100% accurate. But hopefully for you guys who are learning it just like me, you will learn enough and that you'll learn the basics you can get going pretty quickly these videos there are four in the series the first one is the kind of top level introduction and this video probably will be the shortest of the four because in terms of the way a developer approaches containers the advantages are kind of quite easy to summarize and the demonstrations probably won't take too long to do so specifically, what are we talking about here in terms of the developer's view on containers? Well, the problems that we have in development that we're seeking to solve are really, first off, setting up developer machines can be hard and can be, can be slow. So somebody new starts in the company and you might have a, a number of different tools to do this, but what often happens is it can easily take a week of getting source code out, trying to build it, forgetting which service pack you should have installed, tweaking registry settings or PHP settings or whatever it might be, installing runtimes and, and all kinds of stuff. And lots of the errors that come up are not necessarily obvious as well. So one example I can remember is on a Windows machine, if you try and use the IIS rewrite module and you don't have the rewrite module installed, you get some kind of generic error about configuration, which doesn't immediately point you to the fact that you're missing the rewrite module. So some of those things, are, you know, a bit of a faff. And to be honest, we don't really need to do them. Uh, so the tweaks are there. And the other classic issue that we're trying to avoid really is this idea that something works when I run it on my developer machine. But when it's deployed, it's such a different environment that things stop working in production that worked fine locally. And then we can waste a lot of time trying to work out what it is that's different. Now, that problem, the third problem, doesn't really go away when you use containers because clearly a production environment is a different environment anyway. You're going to have different configuration. You're probably going to have different volumes and things mounted. But you're reducing the number of variables by kind of locking in the version of the runtime and uh, the, the code that you're actually using. So that's kind of why you, you get a slightly better experience experience in terms of debugging. So let's actually have a look at this in terms of setup. And I'm not going to go through this step by step. There's not really much point. The installation is fairly straightforward. So we'll look at the, the kind of steps we use for Linux because my demo is going to be on Ubuntu. It's slightly different on Windows and Mac OS, and that's because they use virtualization in order to get Docker functionality. So you, you tend to have an installer. You need to uh, install it and run it as, as an administrator on Windows. But the basic idea is the same. It's certainly not difficult. I've done it on, on Windows for sure. But if we look at, say, uh, Docker, for instance, we go to the page docs.docker.com slash install. You'll see down the edge here, there are instructions for uh, different uh, different environments. But if we say choose Ubuntu, for example, we'll find here that really the steps involve installing anything. If you if you, it's a, an existing PC, make sure you res remove the old versions of Docker because the names have changed. So you wouldn't you would only have to do that if you had older versions of Docker. But that's fairly straightforward. That's just sudo apt get remove. And then they kind of describe a couple of different methods. But if you're a beginner, 
generally you're, you're going to do what you would normally do, which is make sure your repositories uh, for aptitude are up to date, install the various things that you need in order to add the GPG key, signing key for the packages into your machine. And then once that's done, you add a repository for the Docker codes, the, the Docker packages, and then do another update and then install Docker CE, the, the CLI, and Container D, which is the daemon for, daemon for running containers. So that's pretty much it, really. That's um, kind, of, kind of easy enough to do. I don't need to really talk too much about that. Obviously, if you're going to install this on Windows, and I'm not sure how it works on a Mac, make sure if you want to use Docker Everywhere, which usually you probably do want to do, obviously remember to put it into your path. That works automatically when you install it on Ubuntu, so you don't need to do anything separate there. And also, because the container runtime is accessing system level operations, you need to run operations, need to run Docker as sudo or on windows as administrator and so what i've done in the demos you'll see in a minute i've just run sudo dash i type in my password and then I'm, I'm kind of running as root and then it means i don't have to keep writing sudo this sudo that all the rest of it so step two install your favorite text editor i mean really you kind of got lots of different options on windows you don't have to install visual studio but you can do and you obviously get a lot of functionality built in because you could decide to debug things locally without using Docker if you wanted to. And obviously as a, as a text editor, Visual Studio is pretty cool. But Visual Studio Code is a new popular editor as well. You could use your Vim, your Vi, your whatever floats your boat really. Uh, and that's it, that's the install really. So that kind of brings us to how we are actually going to kind of build our application. So let me just, kind of bring over my uh, Ubuntu desktop and if I open up my files and I should have already done this but I didn't and I go into document so I've created two application folders here so each of them are simple I would call them a PHP application but it's not even that it's one PHP file and all that this file does is it echoes PHP info so we can kind of see what's going on later on so that's all it does literally all it does and then in this case we have a docker file as well so the, the process of containerization certainly in the world of docker is there's your source code no different in docker than it would be in any other scenario and this is the only thing that's different. So if we look at this in the text editor, you can see we, we literally have two lines of, of description. And what we're describing here is using a base image, and we'll look at that in a second. And then in our case, copying in the code from sort the source directory, which we just saw here, into this directory on the image that we're using. So from a PHP Apache image, we're copying in some files, and that's all we have to do in order to get a, a working image. So that kind of takes us back to the question of where do we find images? How do we find images? And you might not be particularly surprised to learn that most of the, of the time you can Google them. And if you search for something like PHP Docker, you'll see here that, well, this is Docker Hub. So this is kind of the go-to place for images. If they are present here, then you're unlikely to need to get them from anywhere else. The only other place where you might get them from for Microsoft images is MCR, which is Microsoft Container Registry .microsoft.com. And you'll find that there, that is the default a location to get Microsoft images from if you create a Docker file from Visual Studio. But in general, you can search for them. And look, we've got a whole big page here saying what all the different images are, how to install extensions, etc., etc. So you can kind of spend time working that bit out. But I was kind of looking for the easiest thing that I could do here. And I thought, well, I could use the CLI version, but let's try and get a PHP image that's got Apache in it. So how do we get that? Well, as you can see, the label for this image is PHP, simple enough. And then the colon is basically a tag, and we will look at tags in a bit. But the tag in this case says, use the PHP version, a dash character, and then Apache. And as you might imagine, there are probably hundreds of these different PHP versions and tags. Apache, CLI is probably Nginx out there somewhere, all the rest of it. But if you look at that, and then we'll pop back to 
our uh, desktop here and look at the docker file again you can see that I've taken PHP which is what we just saw version 7.2 and then I've got Apache and because I have Apache the default location for the files in Apache is var www HTML and so that's why I need to copy my file into here and because I've called it index.php when I actually run this up and I visit the page I don't need to do anything special it will just display my index.php as it would uh, with any other default document so that's kind of um, you know all there is in terms of actually you know picking the images try and use official images just for the reason like you try and find official libraries hopefully they're more likely to be maintained updated over time they're more likely to have bugs fixed and security holes closed and whatever so that's probably um, telling you how to suck eggs but but anyway of course there are third-party convenience packages so you might find uh, a one one that i remember for example is someone was talking about I think rabbit message queue and they said oh there, there is no docker image for it so they ended up building their own version of it and they've put that out there for people to use but of course you've got to balance the the concept of well would I rather run that that image myself and be responsible for updating it myself or trust somebody that I might not know who may or may not be maintaining it so you can find the convenience packages but uh, that may or may not be a good idea and you can always build your own image an image really is just a base image plus some other things on on there and then that itself can then be used as a base image for something else so you can build these things up in layers and a base image is, is no different than an intermediate image or a final image in one sense it's just a case of saying well maybe i'll use the the microsoft base kind of um dot net image and then maybe I'll add just a couple of runtime elements that may be not present on that and then maybe I'll keep that in my own uh, uh, registry to use as one of my own images but in general you can probably certainly when you're beginning find what you want on docker hub and crack on so how do we build an image from a base image well we've already seen the docker file we've seen that line that says from image name do something and you can do more than one thing obviously you don't just um, call one line per image and you can use multiple images in a docker file so you could say well let's use one image with the build tools present to build it and then use a runtime image which is much smaller to actually produce the final runtime we showed an example of that in last week's uh, video in the introduction which showed you a dotnet core example you can google that if you want google dotnet core and you'll find uh, the example one with two images in but effectively you write some code which we've seen one php file we add a docker file which we've seen specify the base image and the steps to build and then we simply run a build command and what these elements are here that's obviously the docker command line uh, executable build is what we're telling it to do and then dash t is the tag so we give our uh, image that we're building a name and optionally a tag and again we'll look at tags later notice though importantly at the end is that which is the location of your docker file so if you're running this in the same directory as your app then it would just be dot but you could put a path there as well and we're gonna i've cleaned up this uh, this ubuntu image